Hi there. My name is Eric Barnett, and I'm a singer-songwriter based out of Charleston, South Carolina, and you're listening to Songs of the Unsung. Songs of the Unsung is a podcast where I talk to fellow singer-songwriters about their songs, their influences, and their stories. This week's guest is Rodney Smith. I first met Rodney when he was hosting the open mic night downtown Charleston at Tommy Condon's. Rodney's story is a very interesting one. From growing up near Tulsa, Oklahoma, to moving out to Charleston, South Carolina, to eventually going out to Los Angeles, California, and acting in television shows, short films, and eventually movies, also playing music out there. And now, he's back in Charleston, South Carolina. Enjoy my conversation with Rodney Smith. Thanks for coming out today, Rodney. Thanks for having me, Eric. I haven't seen you a little bit, man. Yeah, it's been a while, man. Yeah. Uh, used to uh, used to host the Tommy Condon's open mic, and I would get out there occasionally. It's It was on Monday night, so sometimes, yeah. you know, being the working man that wakes up at 5.30 in the morning, staying out late on a Monday night kind of sets up a week a little strange, but... Always enjoyed coming out there and enjoyed you hosting and playing songs out there at Tommy Condon. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. What have you been up to these days? Uh, I've kind of been out back gigging into, into the world of Charleston uh, again. Uh, I was talking to you a little bit before this, but, uh, you know, I got back uh, from pandemic and I just, man, I was like, I really don't want to start bartending again. <laughs> Get out of it. Sure. Yeah. So I started doing little gigs and then some bartending, some weddings and things. And then I just really had a couple bad nights and I was like, you know what, let's just play music. You know, yeah. I can do that. And so, yeah. There's a lot of worse things to do. Yeah. yeah so, um, I lucked out. I just kind of mass emailed everybody, sent them my EPK and, uh, some people reached out and filled some weekends up. And so it's, it's been all good. Awesome, man. Let's uh let's hit the way back button. Let's start okay. at the very beginning, man. <laughs> Tulsa, right. Oklahoma. Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's right. Uh, both my uh, parents are from Tulsa, so uh, both the grandparents, the whole family's there, and actually uh-huh. they're all still there. And uh, grew up on the west west side of Tulsa, which uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if there's a stigma or not. I always told there was. I don't I don't know. But I turned out pretty good. I think. I hope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, uh, no, my dad, uh, they had me really young. Okay. They were like 21, 19. Okay. Like yeah. That young. Not done being kids. Yet. Not done being kids. And yeah. then, uh, so, you know, I actually kind of talked to my dad a while back and I was asking him, you know, like, cause he was always playing guitar around. He always right. had guitars. He had a lot of albums. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, uh, he was, he was always listening and it was never anything like I remember like my friends would have like Eagles records and Zeppelin records. He had like Yes and okay. like Mountain, you know, he was. So he was a music fan, not just a casual. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, when I kind of went back and kind of asked him where all this came from, I guess, you know, he was, he said he was a Motown kid growing up. He went to the Marine Corps, got a guitar, uh, learned to play there, went to college, started playing in a couple bands. Um he told me a funny story. He said, uh, he, this band he was playing in, they called themselves Blind Faith, but there was already a yeah. band called Blind right, Faith. Right. right. So he said he was I was play- about to be like, oh, your dad was Steve Winwood? Yeah, yeah, but he right. was like one of these guys like, our Blind Faith is better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so he said, uh, he said one night he was out playing and like, like the bar owner's girlfriend or somebody came up and goes, Joe Walsh is in the audience tonight and he wants to get up and play a song. And, he, and my dad goes, where? And he, they pointed him at and he looked over and he goes, uh, that's not Joe Walsh. And, and they're like, no, 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 that's Joe Walsh. He wants to get up and play. And so uh, I guess the other guys were a little, you know, drunk or whatever. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, yeah, let's get Joe Walsh up here. And um, so my dad goes, I, 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 no, I don't, that's him. And then, uh, so my dad like grabs my mom, I guess her day in the time. He goes, uh-huh. drive home and go get a Joe Walsh album out of my collection to bring it back. <laughs> so he goes, I'll just let you guys play with this guy. Yeah. I guess they got up and they sang like Louie Louie or something like that. And okay. he wanted to play drums. What? Matt was like, <laughs> Joe Walsh wants to play drums? <laughs> so I guess my mom comes back with the record album. They showed the odor and they like kicked that guy. <laughs> Some guy just was trying to pass himself off as Joe Walsh. 
that guy's my hero, I, I guess. Know it. Yeah, that sounds great. Nobody picked up. I mean, you know, I guess this is the day before the internet. From what, what I know about Joe Walsh, I mean, if he showed up and he probably would do something like wanting to play drums. It's, oh it's, my gosh. He seems like a pretty fun guy. Yeah. Oh well we're gonna get we're gonna get to a little Joe Walsh. <laughs> we're gonna get into Joe Walsh. Yeah, I have that I have a good. Joe Walsh tie in later. Okay. So um when then, did you when when did you pick up guitar, you think? Um, well, my dad always had one around and I always would pick it up and strum it, but I just really never had any interest in it. Okay. And then, uh, believe it or not, I actually played football in college and, uh, uh, my sophomore year, I blew my knee out like mm. ACL tear. And that was kind of, that was in 97. And that was okay. back when those kind of surgeries took a long time sure. to recover from. And so yeah. I'm just, I really sat on my butt for eight months, mm. you know? So I was like, I'll play this guitar. And so I started playing and playing. And then uh, I had, believe it or not, a summer camp job. And this guy that I was working with started showing me stuff. And he kind of got me to the next step. And then, um, you know, I just always kind of kept with it. And then, you know, over time, I got out of college and uh, went back to well, I, I, so I bumped around a lot of colleges. Right? Okay, Graduate. yeah, I saw at least yeah. like two. I saw, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was kind of one of those journeyman quarterbacks, but uh, sure. Uh, you know, and, and I went to grad school, and just it was always around. It was always just kind of one of those things. It was around. Mm -hmm. I really didn't study it. I played it a lot. I would come home a little buzzed from the bar <laughs> and play it for like three hours every yeah. night. I did that for a long. I think that's why I got pretty good because <laughs> I was like. Well, if I'm not bringing anybody home, I guess I'm going to go play guitar. Yeah. So I, I played a lot of guitar, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I had kind of things I listened to. And then um, I came to Charleston. And, uh, you know, you just kind of get better and better. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And even eight years in, I wasn't that good. But I was okay, you know. Sure. And then... Uh, one of the things that kind of got me over the end is I eventually met uh, one of my best friends, Kevin West, and he kind of, he just got me that next plateau. Yeah. So kind of right up until then, I was a strummer. You know, I still, I had pretty good rhythm. Um, I wasn't that good, but I was trying to like play with some other guys. You know, it's funny, I actually played with Chris Dodson and yeah. a couple Did other you? guys. Yeah, around. What brought bit. you to Charleston? Teaching. Yeah. I got out of college. I thought I was going to be a football coach. I moved with this girl to Savannah, Georgia. Um, believe it or not, I got a job in Buford. That <laughs> Buford coaching gig turned into a gig in Charleston, West Ashley High School. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I was a teacher at West Ashley High School for two years. I know. This is, this, this is all over the place. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I was like, I'm just dying to play with people. And so uh, there was a couple guys out here in West Ashley. I forget the band. Uh, hand to hand combat. A couple of those guys I used to play with. Okay, uh, Chris I used to play with a little bit. Um, and then you know that. And then uh, who else? Josh Boone and my, Matias Martinez. If you know those guys, they I play around town. I'm, I'm, dip I'm new. There, here. there's <laughs> all these different sections of town that yeah. have different little pockets of musicians that play different stuff. Right, right. Like one of those guys plays metal up in North Charleston. I mean, for me. such a tiny town, Charleston is a big arts yeah. place. You it's know? full of so many good musicians, yeah. you know. And uh, so it's playing with those guys. That didn't work out. I moved to Folly Beach and uh, started bartending out at, it's Tides now, but it used to be the Holiday Inn. Uh -huh. It used to be called Holiday Inn. And there was a big tiki bar out back and I kind of, through a series of circumstances, kind of became like the lead bartender within like two months. They literally fired, like one weekend, some money went missing. They fired a manager and yeah. four, <laughs> five bartenders. Two key ingredients here. One was, one of the bartenders that was hired there was a kid named Eric Mills. Uh -huh. Eric Mills is my bandmate and joint subcommittee. That's yeah. where me and him met. And even back then, he was a madman on the guitar. He was just a powerhouse. He was, uh, he's, he is and still is in the jam bands. Like me and him went and, Saw fish for two days. Okay. That last time they came through. And, yeah. um, you know, I was in awe of his talent, but I was nowhere near that good. And then another thing was, was one of the bar managers we have was this guy named Owen West. Uh huh. And he had, and him and another guy named Ace, Alex, uh, they were rappers, Ace and OC. Shout out Ace and OC. <laughs> and uh, 
they pl- and his brother was this dude Kevin West and Kevin West uh played guitar and, and wrote his own songs and did stuff and for, I remember the first time I saw those guys perform because they had a full band Kevin played sang and played lead guitar and then they had two rappers on stage it blew my mind wow. that this was going on at like the roadhouse which is loggerheads now sure. down at folly beach like i'm on a saturday night night watching it's like lincoln park up here on stage you know what <laughs> i mean and so i just took a liking to him we came friends and uh he you know started showing me stuff on guitar and uh kind of put me over the hump and then i did three years out there and took off for la what was it that took you to L.A.? Uh, a couple things. Um, so Holiday Inn, the owners sold it. Okay. To Advocet, uh Realty. They, they own, it's Tide's Hotel now. Mm-hmm. And they also own a lot of rental houses out there. So Advocet kind of came in and bought up a lot of Folly. And I guess they made them an offer they couldn't refuse. And so they bought the hotel. The last summer I was there, actually, we had some Advocate people there kind of running it. They were like, we're going to get through the summer and then we're going to shut it down Mm -hmm. for eight months, repaint the thing, whatever. And um, I just was like, that's a good time to get out. I just broke up with this girl and uh, I really had nothing to do. And so I drove to Oklahoma where my folks are. And then I was just kind of like, you know what? I've always talked about going to California (laughs) just to check it out. I really had no intentions whatsoever. (laughs) And um, just so happened to be one of my brother's friends was this guy named Zach Whitlow. Mm-hmm. And he was in town and he lived in Los Angeles. And believe it or not, he was a butler at the Playboy Mansion. Okay. And he was like, you're coming to LA? And I was like, I think so. And he goes, come on out. And so uh, <laughs> I was like, all right, I guess I will. So uh, I, had, I had another friend that I drove out to, to see first. And he kind of, you know, screwed me over a little bit. And then uh, so I drove to uh, Los Angeles. And it was just kind of like, you know what? This is the time to go. I got some money in the bank. I got nothing really lined up. So I drove to LA. Zach lets me stay on his couch for like a couple of days, but uh-huh. he had a full house. Like he, like there was three rooms, three different people. He's like, <laughs> I can't let you just stay on the couch. You know? Right. So I found this, like, it was like this little sublet. Um, it was really odd. Um, it was full of furniture. This guy basically had a mansion and he, went bankrupt so he rented he instead of renting like a rental unit in la which is kind of expensive he right rented, he rented this apartment and shoved all of his furniture in it so <laughs> i've stayed in a room but like basically like this it is just wall-to-wall furniture <laughs> but there is like a bed so i can sleep in it and then right. um uh a friend recommended you know hey go be an extra and some stuff and so i started making money that way so mm-hmm. i started to be able to you know make a little bit of a living but I started going to the open mics in Los Angeles. Okay. And uh, the thing about Los Angeles is, is there's so many people out there, you know, they're trying to be famous. You know, yeah. not necessarily they want to be the best musician. They just kind of want to get like seen or have a song. Sure. Or yeah. Whatever. And so Kevin actually has a good saying. He, he goes, everybody wants to be a rock star. Nobody wants to be a musician. Sure. Yep. Yeah. So, but oddly enough, there was these few people we kept kind of all bumping around together Mm -hmm. in the same open mics and then there was this one in burbank at a place called the park bar and we all started going there and then we all just started kind of hanging out because in los angeles there's people our age that don't have kids and are pursuing still pursuing acting or whatever and so they have the nights free they'll go out and sure yeah you go see a comedy show or go whatever yeah and uh so i just then all of a sudden i had this little group of musician friends in los angeles and it was really nice and um i think i uh one of the films i sent you we shot that in one of their backyards like a lot of them yeah was that uh teacher of the year teacher of the year yeah yeah so when did uh so started just as an extra let's go see what that's about yeah and then at some point some acting bug also a directing writing when 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 did that sort of, okay, was well, it a thing where you're just like well i can do that it is <laughs> such a series of lucky accidents all right let me tell you this so i'm First, first extra gig I get, the second AD uh, is this lady named Sean Pipkin. She's now on the DGA board. She's married to Kevin. Okay. Yeah. Like, I, they, they're married to each sure. other now. Yep. We become friends. She starts bringing me on to kind of random shows. We get to community, right? Mm-hmm. Season one, 
uh, I'm just kind of in the background doing stuff. The, Joel's a, Joel McHale's a tall guy, six foot four. They yeah. come up, they come up to me and they go, "Hey, Joel McHale's regular stand in is going to take off for a week. Do you want to stand in for a week?" And I was like, hey, <laughs> "Yeah." And so I got to do that. It was the week Jack Black was on the show too, so awesome. I got to say hi to Jack Black, which was really cool. <laughs> and so then that lasted a week, whatever. So the next season rolled around. The normal guy they had quit, I guess, a month in. Mm -hmm. They brought me on to do the rest of the season. Awesome. So I got to do a whole season two, four months of season two of Community. And then I jumped from like to three different, about three or four different shows. And as a, just as a stand in, is that sort of a, it's a crew get, job. They, they sort of get their lighting with you. They do. And then do you do, do you do any over the shoulder stuff in the other, in the other angles or is it? Sometimes. Some, um, yeah. I've done that. I've done off camera dialogue. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, they get the lighting right. They get sure, because the you're the set. height and you're yeah. roughly the same. Everybody yeah. and then everybody has a standing. It's a union rule, right? Right. So that's because all those actors they can kind of sit in their trailer and, and yeah. get made up and all that, and all the all the work can get done, so they can just roll in and shoot. And because I, you know, film is money and all that yeah. good stuff. Yeah, awesome. So another kind of key component of all this was was I started. Uh, I, I was needing a place to play at the time, and one of the stand-ins on the show had a room open, and the and we moved in. Uh, my girlfriend, now wife, at the time, and it ended up being a band house. Like it was a <laughs> band house. Uh huh. Okay. Let me tell you a funny story. The first first celebrity I ever met in Los Angeles, Tom Morello. Okay. Yep. Grocery store, Vons, Sherman Oaks. I'm going in there just to get something. I look behind me. It's Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine. Right. Yeah. And he's got this bodyguard with him, right? Sure. And I'm like, I gotta say <laughs> something, right? And I turn around, I go, Tom Morello. And he goes, yeah. And I go, hey, I'm a big fan, you know, blah, 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 blah. So it just so happened that uh, he had a side band at the time called Street Sweeper Social Club. Uh-huh. With a dude named Boots Riley. It's pretty cool. And they were going to open for the Nine Inch Nails Jane's Addiction Tour that was going through, I think, in 09, 010. And my brother and, my, and his brother-in-law were going to fly out. And so I was just like, hey, we're going to go see Street Sweeper, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Kind of chatting him up. He, and he was nice. The one thing I will say was, I looked down at the, at the belt. He was buying six gallons of milk. <laughs> and that was it. And okay. I, and I didn't ask. Nope. Why would I? Yeah. Why would I ask him that? Yeah. I get uh, like 2% or are we talking skim? I'm thinking it was, it, it was whole. It was whole milk. Yeah. That's a flex. Was there a bath involved? Or I don't you know. Like, it's LA. It is. It's LA. It's a skin tr treatment yep. <laughs> hey, man. going on. But I'm not going to yuck anybody's I like, yums. I, yeah. I, people are like, why didn't you ask him what he was buying six gallons a month? I, like, <laughs> I, I, I really don't want to know. Um, but uh, so the group of friends I had, mm -hmm. they started making some little bands and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, let me get some shout out. Shout out stage 11. Shout out Lobate Scarp. Uh, a couple friends. Lobate Scarp just actually dropped an album. They're fantastic. Progressive rock band. Stage 11 is the band in Teacher of the Year, isn't it? That's the band in Teacher of the Year, yeah. actually. That's, they, Dusty let us shoot in his backyard. Yeah. And, yeah. But uh, it, we're such a, we were such a cool, it was such a neat little group of friends. And we had this dude Anderson who would go get a house out in Joshua Tree. So like, he's like, anybody want to come out to Joshua Tree? And, yeah. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? Like, who gets to do that? So they all started starting their little bands, little bands. They're, they're awesome bands. And uh, I was like, well, I want to do that. You know, like, I, like the competition comes sure. out. And, yeah. So when I was doing community, my girlfriend's roommate, Rachel, had this friend who wanted to start a band, this dude named Scott Wolf. Mm -hmm. And he was like, hey, if you play guitar, come play with me. I thought he, I guess he wanted me to play lead guitar. I'm not a lead guitar player at all. And I showed up and it's just like nothing but like Nights in White Satin and like, <laughs> you know, like awful cover songs. And so sure. I lasted one practice, but the bass player was amazing. This kid named Adam. Was that Adam Vogt? That was Adam Vogt. Vogt. Adam oh. Vogt. Yeah. So their band dissolved. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I found that out, I, I, I messaged him and I was like, hey man, you want to... Start, yeah. let's let's do something original because yeah. i had some songs i've been writing um so another kind of pin in this i had met a guy i was living with zach whitlow mm -hmm. i ended up moving in with zach me and him became roommates zach uh worked at the playboy mansion 
Mm -hmm. He takes me, he took me to a couple of things. One of them was like this amateur stand up, stand up comedy night. I don't know <laughs> what it was. Cato Kalin was the only like celebrity there. <laughs> yeah, he was trying to stand up. And he introduced me to uh, an employee there named Sheila, and she was married to this guy, Bobby Moore. Shout out Metal Bob. And uh, he was a, you know, like 80s rocker. Like mm -hmm. he still lived on the Sunset Strip. He had the long <laughs> hair. He looked the part, man. Right. He was, and he was so cool. And he was so nice. And uh, so he invites me over. And so he he lets, listens to my songs and he's like, let's just record some stuff here, you know, in my apartment. So he started, you know, kind of working with me a little bit. And one of the things he did, and I'll always thank him for this, is he made me watch a 10 one part, one hour series about how they write pop songs. Hmm. about the formulas, about how they structure pop songs and how they put parts here, part here, part here. Uh -huh. Tension and release, tension and release, tension and release. Yeah. And it just kind of clicked for me. And I was like, man, I could just take all my rock and roll stuff and just kind of put it in this kind of format. Uh -huh. And it made, it, it just made my song, like all of a sudden my songs like went from okay to per, pretty good. They needed editing. They basically. just needed some structure. Yeah. 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 And that kind of became, that also became kind of my proponent in all of our songs when we were playing, in, I was playing in bands. I was able to kind of structure stuff yeah. for everybody. It's like, man, we need to put a bridge right here. We can we reel this in. Yeah. yeah. And so I can't thank Metal Bob enough for that. And so um, I was doing community. We moved into the band house. Mm -hmm. Okay. Me and Adam are playing together. And we're like, well, we need a drummer. We find a drummer, I think on Facebook. It's a dude named Jeff. Real, real fun guy. He mm -hmm. was uh he was also trying to do stand-up comedy at the time. So we played like one practice. And then uh, uh, my wife and I were drinking a little bit one night. We were like, hey, I want to let's call my buddy Kevin. Kevin West. And so yeah. Yeah. I called him up. And he always tells me he wishes he had this call. But we were just like, hey, man, you should always come out and hang out with us, man. I don't know what you're doing, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Just kind of one of those drunk messages uh -huh. to leave somebody. And I guess he was at a point where it like hit him. And he was like, yeah, I should go to LA. <laughs> Next thing I know, he's in the van heading out. Okay. Like a, two weeks later, he shows up. Yeah. I'm like, awesome. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So I think the next day we shot Teacher of the Year, the backyard stuff. I, was, I drug him out. I was like, you're going to be in this scene, man. <laughs> and he's yeah. like, oh, okay, okay. Okay. Hey, was, like, you're letting me stay with you. I guess I'll have to do it. Yeah. He had a blast. And then a couple of days later, we, we played the, th the three piece of mine and he sat in his room and came out afterwards and goes, can I play with you guys? <laughs> and I was like, of course. And so then he added lead guitar to it and uh -huh. it just, just clicked. But yeah. the thing about LA is there's just so many bands. Yep. There's a lot of single players yep. out there. There's a lot of people. There's just a lot of actors who just know how to strum chords. Sure. But yeah. you go and they're, they've got 50 people in the audience. Well, yeah. I, I know too. In LA, kind of everybody tries to do everything just yeah. to see what's going to hit. Yeah. Yeah. Because I I mean, there's a there's kind of a... A uh, cliche of you know you go to L.A. and your waiter has a script and and wants to you know and I'll do anything like I can I'll play I'll, I'll I got a tight five I can do a stand up you know <laughs> oh yeah is, tight, is that tight is tight that, that kind of how it it is yeah. but it's nice it's nice to have options like uh, you it makes it makes you raise your game I mean you're forced yeah. to to either sink to the bottom or you, to to be able to pull ahead you got to raise your game you know but um i learned early on though but you you do have to realize one thing is like you know if you want to be in hollywood you want to be in this in this world man it's all how you look you know yeah, yeah. we took our song driveway we played it for kevin played it for a real famous producer and uh -huh. he goes this is what he said he goes if that song was played by four 19 year olds it'd be a hit because <laughs> <laughs> you guys look like you're in your 40s <laughs> yeah yeah oh. Yeah. Yes, we are, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it's all it's all looks and stuff. So, sure. so that being said, I made a conscious decision. I was like, we need a singer. We need somebody young, good looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To do this, okay. Right. Now, one of the people that I'd met, the low bass guard Adam Sears, he was nice enough to bring like about thirty people on to this album he did, Time and Space, to do a choir. And mm -hmm. we were singing in Latin. Like they brought somebody in. To, yeah, oh, it's, it's okay. amazing. It's a progressive rock band. Sure. Yep. So it's 10 minute, 10 minute long songs. Oh yeah. It's so good though. Um, And uh, so I met this girl, Bree. 
and I'm always going to get her name wrong. Sarah, Sarah, Coo- Sarah Kuglu. Yeah, I wasn't going to. Yeah. I have it written here, yeah. but I'm not. Yeah. So I meet her, and uh, she's she's kind of the life of the party. Uh huh. Like in a room of thirty people, she's the life of the sure. party. And uh, we just kind of hit it off, and you know, we stay in touch, and everybody's Facebook friends these days, and everything. And everybody in LA is always like, "Oh yeah, I need to make you know make sure I'm network with everybody." Yeah. And so, yeah. and then. I had bumped to a show I was standing in on, and it was called Mistresses. It had Alyssa Milano on it. Mm-hmm. Remember that show? Mm-hmm. Okay. I can't Probably not. It. <laughs> it was, it's a chick show. We were just happened to be shooting in Culver City, and we were shooting at a bar, and she just happened to be working there that day. Okay. She was as a cocktail waitress. All right. And I was like, hi, Brie. And she's like, hey, what are you doing? I was like, we're shooting. And yeah. uh, they actually put her in a shot and everything. And so, awesome. And so I'm sitting in my head, and I'm like... If they're looking for youth and they're looking for like, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, I think she's the, I, like, and so I reached out and I was like, what would you think about being like our lead singer? Mm-hmm. And, uh, so she came out and, uh, it, 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 it she, she nailed it. I mean, yeah, really yeah. good voice. Just yeah. really, really good voice. Um, so, but before that we did actually make a music video. I'm sure you saw you that. Did, and you did. And you made an EP. We made two EPs. One, well, I, well, the first EP with, was it Kevin singing on most of it? No. Kevin singing on one. Because uh, the one the one video I'd seen, Driveway, that's, Driveway, that was him singing. Are you singing on the rest of it? Yeah. Okay. On the first EP. Um, okay. That was, Driveway is the only song, him too, that, that he's ever co-wrote with somebody else. Oh, okay. So I had the intro. Uh-huh. And one day we were just sitting around, just kind of throwing like lyrics out or whatever. And I just said, I get high in the driveway and go drive on the highway. And uh-huh. this is like, oh, that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> and I go to work, I come back, he'd written, he'd written all the lyrics out and, sure. and, and all the stuff. Yeah. And then we couldn't, and then I couldn't figure out a bridge. I sat down, I worked a bridge out. Mm-hmm. And so we're just like, I guess we co-wrote it. Like you wrote about <laughs> three parts and I wrote about three sure. parts on this. And so, uh, but, uh. I, you know, I'm always one of these guys. I don't think my voice is very good, you know. But then I'm like, it's you're good, you know. Like yeah, or, you're yeah. you're okay, Rod. You know, yeah, you're not that bad. But uh, it was he wrote all the lyrics and he had, you know, I I had a part and he had two, mm-hmm. and then. Um, but I, I was always kind of like I liked vocal dynamics, you know, like Alice in Chains and like Fleetwood Mac and how they they're just like different singers. And, oh yeah, and they bring different things. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. I don't. Like having just one singer. I, I, if we can have several, like multiple my, layers. My favorite band of all time is the Beatles. Yeah. And I mean, Ringo would sing one occasionally. Yeah. But you had like, for the for a long time, two primary songwriters. And you're the, at the end there, George was there too. And yeah. that's three voices. And that's that's part of what makes it so interesting to listen to them for a long time. Because it things vary. And mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, part of the problem of things being digital is I can't tell all these things just from listening. You know, it, it's I couldn't. I I saw the one video and Kevin was singing. I'm like, oh, that was Kevin. Yeah, I thought that sounded like Rodney on the rest of the. <laughs> then, then what, I guess it well, was. I, sing, I sing on the second verse. Right, he right, sings right. The first yeah, and yeah, the third yeah. And I sing the second. Yeah. And, uh, he sings like the whole chorus, and I sing parts. Yeah, so, yeah. I was trying to do. I I, I love vocal dynamics. Sure, like vocal Absolutely. layerings. Yep. Um. So. <laughs> So, fun story. So, um, one of the things Adam Sears was doing before Lobait was a band called Zizix. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, they, when, when I came to LA, they were actually kind of a little bit of a, of a name. They opened for Steel Panther. Okay. And uh, they had a song about Kirk Cameron, and somehow they got Jer- <laughs> Jeremy Miller on stage, who was on Growing Pains. He uh-huh. was Ben. Uh, yeah, remember that? Yep. Yeah. And we, we met him one night. I knew it, it was. Very odd, but it was, <laughs> but they opened Steel Panther. Steel Panther is kind of big now. Um, so they did the video and the whole time I was like, ah, oh, you know, we're thinking about doing a video too. And he goes, okay, we'll do one. Mm-hmm. And then like literally called me the next day. He goes, all right, so I, I've got a location set up. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you, you act, what? <laughs> I was like, we, I was just talking like yeah. a little bit, like maybe we should do one. He literally l- lined it up. Yeah. And called me up and goes, okay, you guys be here at this time. So we filmed this thing. And so the whole time we're doing it, you know, and I came up with the concept of the video of like, everybody should have their own storyline. And, mm-hmm. and um, side note, side, side note um, the whole time we were talking about this, 
um, that Eagles documentary comes out mm. on Showtime. Yep. It's like a five, six hour long yeah. Eagles documentary and it's fantastic. So our whole shoot in between whatever we're doing, we're just talking about this Eagles documentary. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we get done with the, we get done with the shoot. Um, and then uh, oddly enough, like our bass player quit. <laughs> he hits me up and he goes, Hey, uh, I gotta be gone for a month. And I go, what's wrong? You know, I'm like something wrong. And he goes, no, 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 but I, I can't tell you about it. <laughs> I'm like, okay. All right. So we're all thinking, you know, this is Los Angeles. Maybe he got on a reality show. You know, maybe he's doing okay. something where he can't talk to us about it. Got you know, an he's gonna, he he's gonna go yeah. off for a while. Yeah. Kind of thing. He came back married. Okay. Came back married to a lovely British woman. Uh-huh. Um, and then uh, lasted about two more gigs. And then I got an email. He couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. And, uh, and so that kind of, like all of a sudden, all right. So oddly enough, uh, the singer of Zizix, there was this guy, David Daskal. David Daskal calls me like two, he was the guy that helped us with the video. He calls me two days later. He goes, we should do an Eagles tribute band. <laughs> and I go, heck yeah, we should. And so, <laughs> me, him, Kevin West, mm -hmm. our buddy Fish almost. Okay. And uh, we got this dude, Brad, or David got this dude, Brad, and this uh, girl, Andrea Klein, mm -hmm. who we ended up playing with later. Uh, to play drums and all of a sudden next thing i know they go we learned 30 35 songs in a month uh-huh you forget how many songs the eagles have oh yeah they got a lot and yeah and we're playing out and we're playing to full crowds that are singing along <laughs> and having a great time and it is the best feeling in the world <laughs> the best feeling in the world yeah and um yeah this guy was a wheeler and dealer he was on uh some reality show i think it was Big brother or something. So he was kind of like a mover and shaker. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> he was like talking like Vegas residency and stuff. Oh, wow. And I was okay. like, what? And, you <laughs> know. And then uh, an incident happened where Kevin couldn't make a gig. And instead of just letting it go, they fired him. And I uh, pitched a big fit and they fired me. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so it only lasted about a year. But uh, I still play like six Eagle songs for shit. For okay. Getting out here. <laughs> It always gets, always gets somebody. Somebody I have to, does it. I have to tread lightly on the Eagles because that's my wife's like least favorite oh, band really? in the whole world. It's, it, Eagles can sometimes be a, some people can sort of be against them. There are some Eagles songs I'm not big on, but yeah. there are some Eagles songs I'm very big on. Mainly Joe Walsh ones. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Life in the Fast Lane comes on. That's an awesome song. Oh, yeah, that's I mean, Desperado, you got to be in the mood for it. You know what I mean? Right, right. But uh, so got out of that. Bree comes on board. Um, our buddy Fish, uh, who was in the Eagles band with us, you know, he was kind of a neutral party and all that. He didn't you know, have anything to do with that. And so he came on, played bass for us for a while. Same time, Kevin starts his own band. I'm playing guitar, Fish is playing, Adrian's playing. So I basically got two bands going on. I got one of my own original music, one of Kevin's. Uh -huh. And then uh, I pick up another bass player. I offer Fish the full-time job. He didn't want to do it. Uh, pick up a dude named Zach. And so <laughs> we finish our EP. We finish Speed of Sound. Got five songs on there. Mm -hmm. Um Bree had a song and Kevin had a song I wanted to do. And I could tell right about halfway through recording, I was like, somebody's going to flake on this. Yeah. And, uh, I was like, I think I'm just going to record my songs. You know what uh -huh. I mean? Because like, uh, and then uh, I was like, because if I'm spending my money, you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. And I put out a song that Bree writes and she quits two months later like sure yeah you know, I, I went through that already there's sometimes you can be in a situation like a band and, and you can kind of look around and realize like you know for better or worse and no judgment but yeah. i think i care the most about this mm -hmm. by a large magnitude <laughs> yeah and it's it's hard to it's hard to carry the basket for everybody you know yeah. and at some point you just gotta like you said i'm i'm paying i'm gonna be here yeah my song it also, it, it's weird how like people can resent you for kind of like stepping up and taking charge. Like, like, cause I'm like, 
playing quarterback, I kind of naturally have a little tendency to just kind of, yeah. like, I'm going to get stuff done. And so, I mean, if it's, if it's just, if there's nobody leading a committee is hard to get things done, especially when people are, there are people who are kind of just followers, you know, somebody has to step up and say, this is, let's pull this thing. Together. Somebody has to captain the ship. Somebody has to make, yeah, has to make a decision. Yep. But uh, you can't have like, that was one of my early bands in West Ashley was like, like I tried to set a schedule to practice and they'd be like mad at me for it. You know, yeah. I was like, why, why are you mad? like, <laughs> who, who put you in charge? Like, well, nobody else Some, is saying somebody's, anything. Yeah. So he's got to say something. Yeah. So, um, where did you record, did you record both EPs in the same place? No. Um, the first EP we recorded, believe it or not, with this guy named Arthur Barrow. And Arthur Barrow was Frank Zappa's first bass player. Okay. So through a friend of a friend. Yeah. He just literally, he was literally like two blocks down like this. And, uh, and he had a little recording studio and in the back of a just shopping complex. And, uh -huh. and my friend George goes, uh, shout out George Libel for this. And, uh, he goes, this guy, Arthur Barrow, uh, used to play for Zappa. He'll just record you for like this amount of money. Right. Yeah. Um, and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Went in there. <laughs> it's full of all this stuff, whatever. Yeah. And so I walk in and obviously he does, he does sessions and he goes, uh, he just kind of looked at me and smiled. He goes, are you a Doors fan? And I go, yeah. He goes, uh, what are you using for your amp? And I go, well, I got this, P I got this, uh, PV. <laughs> and he goes, do you want to use that, uh, Fender amp right there? And I look, and it's like a, uh, I want to say it's Fender Deluxe. It's, it's kind of like that, it, but it was, uh, one of the beige ones, one of the, uh. Yeah. Yeah. And he go, and I go, why? He goes, he goes, uh, Robbie Krieger came in and did some tracks yesterday and I haven't touched that amp since. He goes, I don't know if you want to play with his tone, but if you plug it in right now, you can play with his we'll tone. We'll give it a go. And yeah. I was like, I absolutely want to play with his tone. <laughs> yes. So I just canceled whatever tone I was doing. I, sure. I, I put that right on the album. Sounds good. So, uh, and then um, the second time around, uh, there was a, a guy uh, I met named Ryan Thomas and he had a band called uh, Rival the Giant. Mm-hmm. And they had, they put a couple EPs out and I thought really well done. And so I asked him, I was like, well, what's, who, who'd you do this with? And he gave me a name, this guy, Tyler Payne, mm -hmm. who recorded in his basement. So we went down and recorded some stuff. And then he ended up becoming partners with this kid named Eric Lloyd, who was the kid in the Santa Claus movies. Oh, okay. Remember that kid? Yeah. Yep. So yeah, I'm walking in, I'm like, are Aren't you, uh, it is like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So that's what I did. <laughs> obviously homeboy's got some money. So they built this huge recording studio and we, we did it there and they, they, they had a big green, like two story green screen. They did, uh -huh. I mean, they put money, money in. Wow. This. Uh, recorded it there. Um, just like any recording, it took four days and then it took eight months to freaking mix it. You know what and I mean? That's how it works. I know. Yeah. I record music and I'm the same way. Like people are like, is it ready yet? I'm like, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, <laughs> well, and so they, we shot a video and, uh, we got on the roof and, um, to this day I am like so thankful that roof didn't like fall in. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. I was just, I was like, you I, start remember, I remember, I remember saying like, Stay on the beams. Make sure you guys are like standing on the did, beams. Did don't, you start, don't stand in the middle. Of like where the, Did you start looking around and going, well, you look about 185. No, it wasn't that. It was that just, drum set's got to be. <laughs> oh, that was the thing is our drummer just kind of like at the last moment was like, I, I'm not going up there. And I was like, okay, okay. I mean, I'm not going to, yeah. you know. Yeah. So we shot it. Uh, we had a big kind of thing. So... <laughs> Right, right when our EP was get, was done, two weeks later, our singer Bree comes up to me. She goes, "Hey, uh, I'm gonna do my own short film." Mm. I was like, "Cool, I'll mm -hmm. help. I'd yep. love to." And uh, she made her little short film, and um, she was trying to get her SAG card, which everybody out there yep. is. And yep. uh, but she comes to me one day and she goes, "I'm not gonna be able to play any Friday or Saturday nights for the rest of the year." And it was April. It was April. Mm, and yeah. I was like, we're about to drop this CD. I have gigs lined up. And you're uh -huh. telling me you can't play any of them? <laughs> so we tried playing as a four piece, like a couple gigs and it just didn't work. And then, uh, 
this girl that was, uh, we had the same agent, uh, this girl, Catherine Stefanik, shout out Catherine, uh, kind of stepped in and, and did some gigs for us. I'm saying, and, uh-huh. uh, she did a really good job and, uh, went through another drummer, uh, <laughs> him and his wife moved. So I picked yeah. up, I picked up, uh, low bass carts, ex drummer. He stepped in and he was a madman on the drums. He was fantastic. And then, um, I got a new bass player, the new bass player. He was a cruise ship guy. He just got off a cruise ship. Oh, okay. With a boatload of money. He, so he's practiced up. So he's all way practiced up. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, I just checked his Instagram today. He's back on the boat. He's like doing shows now. On the boat. I know some dudes who, uh, who do the cruise ship thing. That's good for a single man. Yeah. That for, and it's, and it's good for young folks too. Like the folks I know, they're like, are my age. They're 40 and they're like, yeah. I've just aged out of the cruise ship thing. It's a lot. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, you feel like you're going to be like Wooderson from uh, yeah. Days Confused. Like, right. <laughs> these stewards get older. I stay the same. Yeah. <laughs> I get older. So, uh, basically, um, you know, like just just bands are bands. They just, people yeah. come in and out. You know, I try to keep something together. Try to keep something afloat. And uh, I got a couple more replacements. Uh, a couple guys came in and played some gigs for us. And they were awesome. And um, we really lucked out because, okay, so Kevin ended up marrying Sean Pipkin, uh, who is in the Directors Guild. She's, mm. mm-hmm. she's going to be directing movies before this is all over with. She ended up getting a gig in Charlotte. So she went out to work on a TV show for Charlotte. They were nice enough. We were, we were kind of like about to, uh, you know, get kicked out of our place. We didn't actually dig get kicked out of our place, but... They were like, just come, you know, take care of our place while we're gone. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, wow. So uh, it was kind of, uh, I kind of nice. <laughs> yeah. We could do that. And so we worked for a long more time, and then we, we stayed out there for a little bit longer. And, uh, you know, everything just kind of comes to an end. You know, uh-huh. it's either like, we, we need to head back or we're going to be homeless. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but a um, uh, couple fun stories here. Uh, you know, it's funny. It's like you go see band, like you go out to bars and stuff. You know, in LA, there's just everybody lives out there. All the major rock stars or whatever. Yeah. And so, yeah. if you wander into the right bar at the right night, uh, you can catch like like somebody said they saw Alice in Chains in a in a local bar under a different name because they were about to go on tour and they just needed a warm up. Needed gig. a practice gig. Yep. Yep. Um, Metal Bob told me before. I guess the last. There was a Van Halen tour. He lives literally like right, if you know L.A., uh-huh. right below the Roxy and the in the, in the um, uh, not the whiskey, the uh, uh, what's the place where Zeppelin went all the time? Um, or where, where Lemmy was from. He lived in the same building as Lemmy. Let's just say that. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah, if you yeah. saw the Lemmy documentary. Oh like yeah. He lives like a block from. Um, God, I can't remember right now. Of course. Um, <laughs> But it's the same thing, you know, it's just like, there's people everywhere. So if, sure, you, if yeah. you're in, like Van Halen played the Roxy for, you know, a week just to warm up. So everybody in the kitchen came out and was like, I guess we're going to get to yeah. a Van Halen show every day. You know, I know the stones are pretty notorious about, they always do a warm up gig before yeah. they do. They fly out to LA and there is like one place. And I don't even think they let like the general public in, mm-hmm. but I think they let like friends and family and every, yeah. people in. Yeah, I know the Stones are pretty good about doing a warm up gig out there in just a tiny club in L.A. I'd love to be a fly on the wall yeah. for that one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, uh, Lobe played a show one night. The Plain White Tees played a secret show immediately after them. <laughs> they were terrible, but uh, you know, uh, but you know, they're they're kind of known. You know, right? I mean? yeah. Just like oh, and here's the Plain White Tees. Yeah, like, what? Huh? And so, um, but yeah, I mean, it was just. It was really fun. Uh, we had a lot of friends. They all we all put each other on our own other gigs. Uh, yep. Out of that group, kind of stage eleven, kind of was the top dogs, and they always looked out for everybody. Like they they did like a residency at Canner's Deli, and they brought like everybody in and let us play like open for them and do mm-hmm. like, whatever. So, um, I had a I had a really fun time. I tell you, I tell you a quick story. So, um. Oh, when I was on Mistresses, another thing about Mistresses was that there was this actor, Brett Tucker, and he was the uh, 
he was the uh, husband of Alyssa Milano on the show. He's an Australian actor. And so mm -hmm. he had a guitar one day and I was the guy he stood in for. We just hit it off, man. And so yeah. he invites me out to uh, play a gig with him. He had this friend from Australia, another actor named Bernard Curry, mm -hmm. who's like, I guess, kind of well-known too. And th these two guys are like Hollywood actors. And they're yeah. just like, yeah, just come on, play, <laughs> play with us and uh, whatever. There's a bar in West Hollywood called The Parlor. I guess that's where all the Australians okay go sure you know yep so but that was neat um and then just randomly here i wrote uh just kind of randomly people i just happened to just kind of stand in for that were famous uh it's getting tyler hilton i stood in on the show called extant he put he was the guy that was elvis in the walk the line movie mm. he actually is okay. a, he's actually yeah. a working musician he goes out and plays a bit um mary clayton She's the she was the lady that sang oh, "Give Me Shelter" oh, with the yeah. Stones. Yeah, the last thing I ever worked was a show called "The New Girl," and it was a Christmas episode. They brought her out and all these like standing in the show, shadows of Motown. Or what is that? What was that documentary about? Twenty feet from yeah, stardom. Yeah, twenty feet from stardom. Yeah, they brought them all out and did the the Christmas. You know the song yeah. from the opening of Christmas Vacation. Uh huh. That was the like the special guest. <laughs> they sat in the back room like and just told stories and oh man. Like everybody was around them, just listening, just quiet as a mouse, just oh, listening yeah. to him. Um, there was a guy named Dean Parks. I got a chance to stand in for, and I, I could. He was one of those guys that you tell something, something's right about this guy, mm -hmm. like, you know. And so I'm, I'm, in, you know, I can't like be on my phone when I'm working. And sure, so yeah. In the middle of a break, I, I message Metal Bob, and I go, Metal Bob, look up Dean Parks for me. <laughs> he messaged me back with the link, and he goes, oh, and it says, Holy shit. He's he was like the session guitar player for everybody. He had, uh -huh. he wrote part of Beat It. Okay, he worked, played yep. like Madonna's albums, like everybody's mm -hmm. stuff. And just this really nice old guy. Yeah, and uh, I he walked out. He like it was like almost like two minutes after he walked off. I got the call <laughs> like who this guy was. Now I know who he is. Great. Oh my Great. gosh. <laughs> um, somehow David Daskal got us into a music video shoot for this kid named. Trev Lukather. He's Steve Lukather's son from uh -huh. Toto. Okay. And so he, they were like, we got this Hollywood Hills house. We're going to invite everybody yeah, up. Yeah. And uh, so we show up and I go, well, can we drink? Like, can we, can we bring some like drink? Bring you something? He goes, they were like, no. <laughs> and I was like, why not? And then come to find out they'd shot all this footage the week before. Mm -hmm. Like six, seven hours of footage. Put all the equipment in this room and everybody like partied all night long. And somebody snuck in and stole, stole all the uh, equipment. Oh, okay. So yeah. this is a reshoot. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. they were like, nobody's drinking. It's not happening again. <laughs> the funniest part, well, I have to tell this story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'll tell it. All right, the funniest part was, was he had a sister and I guess it was like one of their houses. And she comes in and she goes, I thought I made it abundantly clear nobody was to use the bathroom downstairs. Somebody's taking a massive shit and it's clogged up the whole. Like it was just. <laughs> you want to talk about a party just erupting into a sea of laughter? Oh yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. The tension went right out of that room. <laughs> so, but then, um, so we left LA, moved back to Charleston. Mm -hmm. Um, what year was this? 15? This was, no, this was the end of 2016, 16. beginning of 2017. Yep. Eric Mills was working at Tommy Condon's. And he calls me up and he goes, hey, uh, any interest in hosting an open mic? And I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, they we got a new manager, this guy, Michael Parker. Shout out Michael Parker. Uh-huh. Yeah. Do you remember him? He was the bar manager at the yeah. open mic. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Parker... Uh, was in town, didn't know anybody that played music around town. So he asked Eric, Eric just knew that I was back. So he offered it to me and yeah. I was like, sure, you know? So that was the live is live music itch. I got to scratch. Awesome. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I, I really, I tried to come back and maybe play a little bit and I just was like, I don't know. I'm just, kind of, <laughs> I want to put it on the back burner for a while, Uh huh. but I got to do the open mic and it was fantastic. And, um, I did, I brought all the, uh, sign in sheets here. Yeah. I'm trying to be quiet while I page through them, but I'm also <laughs> like interested in like seeing all these names, you know, there must be 200 pieces of paper there. Yeah. It's interesting to look at all these pages and, and remember like I can, there's sometimes I see a page my name's on and I kind of can even like remember a particular night yeah. out there, you know? 
Oh yeah, it's uh, I mean it was it was fun and it was a real good way to kind of jump right back in the music scene and uh, you know the, they didn't pay me a lot but they were like you can have a free tab and so I really took advantage of that. Sure, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to the point where they're like, all right, we're capping that. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know it was it was fun and then like I say when I first started up. They were just, it was just Dave Barry and, and, the, and the Bog Rats on the weekend. They, uh -huh. they didn't really have anybody else doing anything. And uh, so I, I went around, I actually did all the social media. I actually went up to College Charles and put posters in the, you know, stuff. Wow. And yeah, I made, I made the whole thing. I was like, if I want to do this, I'm going to do it all the way. Slowly but surely. So, um, you know, right off the bat, Bubble Max showed up. You know, Cat Strickland showed up. Uh, who else? Dylan Evans, if you know Dylan. Yeah, fantastic Dylan, player. Yep. John Sherrill, who's moved to Montana, used to come in and play a bit. Uh, a few other people, Darlene Madison Frank, El, let's do name Elliot, uh, Tim Falvey, Uncle Tim's Bench used yeah, to come I mean, in. Yep. Holland Bell and Rick. Holland Bell and, and Rick. Uh, ben Somewhere. Yeah. Ben Somewhere shows up and he and he, he, he was it, he was so excited he was like man yeah this is i'm gonna do this i'm uh -huh. gonna do this and even like early on he was like i'm gonna get a band together too man uh -huh. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get a band going i was like yeah do it dude yeah come on man um there's a few west ashley crew guys jeep and bob and tom yep. kenny if you know those guys yep. uh cat and pete um gosh who else keith and nathan miller Remember those guys? Yeah, father yeah. and son. They play around town. Seen Cat Strickland is there. Cat was in times. there. Corey Tate can't used to come out. Yeah, uh, made really good friends with my buddy John Zachary. Yeah, John's in both my films actually. I um, noticed John. I noticed when I watched uh, when I watched him. I recognized John and I recognized Iman. Yeah. in the in the other one. Yeah, and, and of course Hillary. In, and in, oh, and Hillary and. Yeah. Um, no, I'm on, and uh, believe it or not, actually, I've made a, a, a recent film. I haven't, I haven't shown, I didn't send it to you, but uh, Blue Ricky did both the songs in it. The oh, really? The opening and the, and the closing That's songs. Awesome. Yeah, I was like, I'm going to punk rock this this one up. You know? Yeah, right. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to read through some names here just because I'm, I'm little shout outs here. Uh, For sure. Brittany Opperman, remember her? Yeah. Uh, Justin Hodge, Jameson, Will Hansen. He's in Sad Sun now. He, he did the Jive app. Jenna Desmond, she's in this Babe Club band right now tomcat adam tomcat yeah uh kevin roach he's my buddy i like kevin kevin's a good cat dude named scott miller remember scott miller yes he was a wild guy with the with the cowboy hat and the left uh, hand ovation yeah man yep, he was, yep, yep. He was, oh he was awesome um guitarists always remember people by the guitar <laughs> that drew marler came in he plays around town yep uh Chris Dodson came in, Kevin came in, Jeff House came in, Jameson came in. Uh, his name Dan Tucker. Remember him? Mm, his dad know. used to play with Allison Krauss. His dad came in and played one night. Okay, yeah. And as far okay, and even as far as all the regulars that came in, I had a seventeen-year-old state fiddle champ from Louisiana come in. Mm -hmm. Him and his his dad got, took the guitar. Blue, mind blowing. <laughs> One night, the Westminster Choir uh, College came in after performing for uh, Spoleto. Mm -hmm. uh, like twenty six people got up and like sang a sang a couple songs in the middle yeah. of Tommy Con. And you, it was like you, you <laughs> couldn't believe it, and um, it was just really neat stuff like that. Just to see yeah. like somebody rolling in from out of town and be like, "Can I play a song?" I mean, it's just mind blowing. Yeah, or to see like a uh, you know like a Holland Bell who is really nervous at the beginning and then good lord flash forward to oh, a we've, year later yeah we've seen the entire we've seen her like entire career I yeah mean, like well, not entire i mean up until now yeah like it's one of those where she's going to be somebody where you and i can say we saw her yeah. win you know she's got amazing songs and and and, and uh, you know that's another thing is you see people come through and they've, they've got their own original music and it's just yeah. so good and yeah i think Charleston really kind of sets the bar high for musicians because it you you really I mean as good as I think I am I'll just go down to the poorhouse and be like <laughs> I'm terrible. You know what I mean? The wonderful thing about I Charleston, play. what I love so much about Charleston is I feel like in L.A. or in Nashville mm -hmm. or 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 a larger market you can get completely lost. Yeah. Like in Charleston, number one, they do set their bar high. However, they support people 
through their process, yeah. you know, with all the, with all the open mics there, there was a point pre pandemic where you could, aside from Friday and Saturday, you could go out to an open mic night every day of the week, sometimes two. Yeah. And, you know, just for a new performer, whether it's young or old, what a new performer, just having a stage available to you mm -hmm. and having people who are supporting you. And, and that's such a big thing. And I've seen, I, I came to this town, not knowing anyone mm -hmm. and not being able to get a gig and the whole thing. And you start out at open mics and that's when you go, I need to up my game. This is how I need to do it. Mm -hmm. And just building that and building that it's, I think Charleston is kind of the best of both worlds between a, a big town or a big city and a little town where it hits that right down the middle. You yeah. Know? But you came in polished. Like you came in no. able to play. I, to a, to a degree, to a degree. Yeah. But I mean, I've, I've polished more in the last five years than I did the previous 10 yeah. because, because of access. I come, I come from Ohio. That's mm -hmm. no big secret. Right. But where I come from, um, there's not a lot of places that you can play like that. Yeah. And when you sit in your own home, you play a song maybe until you mess up and then you just lose interest and move along. Yeah. But when you are up in front of people, you got to make it through that song. Yeah. And it's, it's something where you're, I, it, the access of this really makes people up their game and polish and, and also the community of, you know, you might, you might've seen the people at the open mic the night before or the week before. And, and they say, Hey, you know, I heard you do the song this time. You've really improved in this and it's really helped everybody up their game. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, that's why I'm, I'm super happy to be talking to you because you're one of the first people I met coming to this town who was like, here's a stage, here's a microphone, let's plug yeah. in and play some songs, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember you coming in because, like, um, I mean, I'm not going to say I like, but everybody's at a different level, you know, of their career. Sure. Obviously, Absolutely. you know, getting up on stage and playing for the first time is a big step, you know. And, yes. Uh, and then, you know, me coming from playing all those like to me it was just like i just need to get back up it's like i, I need to go work out you, you need know to get the mean? muscles back I, need, I need to not let those muscles you out. didn't forget how to do it but yeah. the muscles got weak yeah but i was i always told myself i was going to be very supportive i'm never gonna uh i'm always gonna make sure i'm all clap i will clap as loud yeah when they're done just sure. to, just to get it going you know nobody needs to be feeling bad when they're getting off stage like that's the worst right thing. right um but i'm not gonna say like bad things didn't happen you know like uh, it's an open mic man a anything you know, that can happen will i mean you know, i had to like tell this guy to quit hitting on the 16 year old i had to like uh -huh. there was a guy that got arrested for some bad stuff you know yep. like uh yep. i remember that yeah um i mean you're you're gonna have some people look at an open mic night as like we look at it in terms of you're going to have eight to 12 to 15 people go up there and sign up and play their songs. And occasionally somebody will say, Hey, would you sit in with me or something? Mm -hmm. Some people see an open mic as an opportunity to, for it to be the them show all night yeah. or, or, you know, it's anything can happen. <laughs> and I, it's as a host, you have to walk that fine line of making sure everybody has a good time, yeah. but also being a little, and, and being diplomatic, yeah. but also a little, sometimes being like, all right, man, it's been your time. Now it's her time, or now it's his time. Yeah. or And this is how we all get along. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I, I've never hosted an open mic night. Uh -huh. And I, that, that person's not in me. Like that, like I, I've, uh, I you got to pull the plug. You got there. There has to yeah. be like, okay, you're done. No, see that person's in me. That person's in me. I don't know how to do it nicely. Uh, <laughs> we don't have like, to do it nicely. Like I am just, I, I don't know, man. Like there's a part of me that like just wants justice out of this world. Yeah. It's like, everybody should just play nice, man. <laughs> you know? Do you remember that guy that used to get on stage and talk about tits? Sing about tits? Remember I that do. guy? I do. I do. <laughs> And she had those old tits and like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, he had like a seven minute song and about it, it. And I finally like, you're done after this. Like I, I mean, pull him, I like, it's a behind family him. 
I it's, know it, man. Yeah, yeah. Read the room. You oh, got to read the room. I yeah. let, let me just go to the list here. I, I had a magician who got <laughs> car, all his card tricks wrong. Um, that could be awesome. I, I had a comedian who's a comedian here in town. Got on stage, wouldn't get off. Uh, I was literally like, hey, man, just do like five. He's like, all these other people get 15. I'm going to stay up here 15. And then he didn't have 15 minutes worth of material. You know, I was like, well, that's as far as a then. comedian, I will take a tight five. Over a rambling 15 any day. <laughs> Who thinks comedy where you're just like, okay, what's going on in the news today? Or, hey, where are you from? You're like, have some jokes, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, sure. you know. Uh, I had a, yeah, and I had a rapper uh, who was actually pretty good. Um, and then I had a, like, crackhead off the street who <laughs> tried to rap and it was really bad. Cool. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it just kind of, and then pandemic hit, and it was just kind of like, I think, you know, I just need to let this go to somebody else, and uh, yeah, 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 and did that. But um, my nightmare scenario at open mics is always, I don't like performing with other people unless I've rehearsed with them. Yeah, because that's just my own particular brand of anxiety, mm -hmm. especially my own songs, which I attempt to write songs in a way that. You don't necessarily know what's coming next. Right. So somebody to sit on that ever ha without ever having heard it, it's just like, no, nah, man, I, I, you had your 15. I'll take my 15. Mm. It's like when you get up there and people just assume, like, well, I'm just going to bring my cajon up here and play with you. And I'm like, I'm playing a slow song, man. <laughs> Please, <laughs> <le> yeah. <laughs> I remember your buddy coming into town and you guys playing together. Yeah, yeah. You guys were good. But we, I mean, we'd played together for a long time, yeah. you know. Now that uh, now that you're not hosting the open mic, you're kind of gigging. Little, well, that was kind of uh, I I just got a lot of local acting work all of a sudden. I got two movies back to back. Oh wow, wow. yeah, one's called Beowulf. It's on Tubi right now. One okay. still hasn't come out, but like I got that that, and then a series in Charlotte, and uh, it just it just kind of worked out. I was kind of lined up for like the next few months, and so I was like. Excellent. This, if there was ever an out, you know, sure, this was the time, and so yeah. uh, that happened. And then, but right when it happened, the pandemic happened. So, yeah. uh, the first film I did was it's going to come out. It's going to be called The Radcliffs. Um, it was right pandemic or COVID hit right then. And then when I did Beowulf, it was right when the vaccine rolled out mm. like if you can remember that time right when they were kind of like we got vaccines but we don't have enough for everybody yep it was right yep god it was like march mm -hmm. and then um but then everybody stopped playing you know what i'm saying it's like yeah. they, they shut yeah. down the bars nobody was playing out or doing anything and right. so uh you know it was i was just like i think i'm gonna just kind of stop doing this for a while and sure. um so then pandemic hit and in this whole time I'm, I'm bartending in a place called community pizza mm -hmm. up by Tanger Alley. Yep. So one of the cats working there is a uh, guy who's a drummer in joint subcommittee. He was one of the cooks, this guy, Trevor, Trevor Roy. And, um, you know, we just worked long enough. We get talking, you know, like, yeah. Oh, you're a drummer. Yeah. Like, we went to school for it and everything. Uh, fun story. Dave Mustaine came in to that community. <laughs> to community pizza. pizza. Yeah. Okay. He was staying at the hotel next door. They were right. doing the, um, Jimi Hendrix tribute show. Oh yeah, 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 and yeah, he he came in and bought beers for all the military. Okay, yeah, he's cool. Did he walk in and say, "Let me tell you how mad I am about Metallica"? I did. He's no, he was the coolest that. guy ever, man. <laughs> and, and I didn't recognize him at first. Like, really? Yeah. Yeah. He 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 he's a uh, he's an elderly looking gentleman these days. Um, we all but we got a picture yeah. with him. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so pandemic hits. And we were like, are we really going to be not working for like the next? Mm. So I was like, let's play some music, man. And so uh, Tr Trevor got, I guess, some of his money, got some, a new drums. Um, my And then Eric Mills. I'd always kind of been wanting to circle back to him and yeah. do, do a project with him. Yeah. Because he was just always so amazing. And he, he had a couple other bands. So three of us, I was going to try to play rhythm guitar like in... Jeff L. Jerry, and then we tried a couple people out, uh, and it just nothing ever, you know, gelled. And so I was like, you know, I can play bass, and yeah. uh, I'm okay bass player, but uh, <laughs> but Eric is a madman on the guitar, uh -huh. and it's so funny that the two joint subcommittee songs that we do, those are my songs. He literally has 25 songs <laughs> that we did all 
I I only had three songs that I brought to the band. He he literally brought everything else. Wow. And stack like this big, you know, an inch thick. So when's the album? Well, that was the thing. Is like, <laughs> so we go into the recording studio, and I took my pan down the money. I was like, I'm gonna make this this thing. And so we played uh, Tin Roof. Yeah. And met Todd Brown, who's the sound guy. Mm -hmm. He's the bass player in the 33s. He owns yep. a recording studio called Return to Zero. That's where okay, yeah, been somewhere. Yeah, he, we kind of I know it through them. You know, like right. I recorded. I think I recorded Blue Ricky doing some stuff out there. Okay, at yep. one point. So we played uh, Tin Roof, and Todd was like, "Man, I want to put some 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 of your stuff guys some of your stuff down." And I was like, "Love to come out." Yeah, the studio's absolutely. amazing. Yeah. Um, so Eric. And his wife had planned this cross country trip and it was already set. <laughs> and so he kind of had a hard out. Yeah. And so I, we had about a month or two to play with. And so I was like, hey, man, I want you to come in and, you know, record these two songs of mine. And, and I was like, I'll even put up the money if you want to do a couple of yours. Uh huh. And he just kind of was like, um, nah, we'll just do yours. <laughs> and I didn't really, I mean, and I was like, that's very sweet of you because he didn't have to do you sure. know, that at all. Sure. Or he could have done it and you right. know, maybe pay for it and he didn't. And um, so we went in and we did three tracks. Uh, two came out great. One one still has some vocal stuff to to deal with. Mm -hmm. John Zachary came in and did some backup vocals for us. Oh, Cor nice. Corey Tate did too. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just kind of like a lot of mixing and stuff. Uh, Todd, Todd records a lot of people out there. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of whenever I can get to them with some money. But uh, we kind of finally came up with a couple of mixes we liked. And um, it's like I can't sit on it anymore, you know? Yeah. But Eric and his wife ended up moving to Greenville. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, so that band only lasted a couple, like about eight, nine months. Okay, yeah. But it was fun. It was a fun <laughs> band. Um, but... Uh, yeah, and then after that, just kind of, I, I got an opportunity to work in a film up in Winston Salem with this uh, kid, and actually wrote music for a song that we're going to use in the in the film. It's called Fifty Times Rock, I think. Awesome. Um, and then uh, came back and just kind of been gigging ever since, man. So now, do you play some of your own tunes during the gig? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Awesome, man. Now. I know we've just been talking about bands. We've been talking about Jet Pilot Jerry. We've been talking yeah. about Joint Subcommittee. Is there a Rodney Smith? <laughs> well, I yeah, of course. There's I mean, like... I'll tell you this because I started out. I I was in bands. I loved playing in bands so much until it got to the point, you know, where people got married and it was harder. It's hard as hell to keep a band together. Yeah. Uh, you know. I always liked, I always preferred bands where everybody were, was friends first. Yeah. Just because then it's like not like your coworkers. It's like you're, you're all in it, you know? It's nice to drink a beer with your bandmates. The yes. The gig, you know? Yeah. You'd want to hang out with them anyway, you know? Yeah. And, uh, because you got to be in a car with them for a long time too, a lot of the yeah. time or in a studio or in, in what have you. And, um, but there, there, there came in like a point where I was like, man, I can't hold a band together anymore. That's sort of where my singer songwriter thing came from. It's just because it's, you know, even when it's time to record my record, I just play everything on it because it's just hard to get, yeah. hard to keep people together. But there is nothing like being in a band. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like being up there when you're up there by yourself. You're by yourself. <laughs> and, you're by yourself. Yeah. yeah. So that being said, I mean, I know you got some songs. When's the when's the Rodney P or, <laughs> or, or record or I don't know. You know, I always uh my creative faucet, I, I listened to a couple of these beforehand. You said you, you write your songs slow. Um mine just kinda come like it's hard to say kind of like, fits and starts and I'll have spots of creative of creativity. Uh huh. Like I'll have like like I wrote three songs and like Two weeks and then yep. nothing for the next six months. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. And, uh, but they're, uh, but they're, I, I mean, but like, I, I still, I'm, I'm always going to have like just songs coming out of me. Like, I, uh, I have a couple of songs here. I got one making up to you. I think we were talking about 
Yeah. Maybe I'll play that one if that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we go ahead and hear that? You want to tell me a little bit about it first? Uh, this is kind of one of those songs. Um, I think I was listening to R.E.M. a little bit on this one, and I think I came up with the pre-chorus, and I just built the song around the pre-chorus. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you do that. Like I'll, Sometimes I'll just take like a guitar section I like and just kind of like, how can I yeah. keep that? Yeah. You know? it's. I rarely write songs from the start. You know really? what I mean? The, from the first word you say through the last word, it's it's just like movies that you don't film them in order. You yeah, know? it's songs kind of come out the way they do. Rock and roll. Let's hear it, man. All right. Sun rises on a new day. Sand story, another payday. I'm so sick of what I play. Think it's time to go away. Know that it's all my bad. Can you please let it go? My angel always have been forgiveness for my sins, a second chance. Life's renew Just want to Make it up to you On the highway Headed back home Time to reap What I've sown this old city is all that I've known. I'm tired of being all alone. And I know that it's all my bad. Can you please let it go? Chance, life renewed. I swore to make it up to you. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Awesome, man. It's a good one.
Well, yeah, I just, you know, it's funny as I, I, I've been listening to this, uh, up to this, you know, listening to some podcasts and people and, uh, it's funny how everybody's songwriting process is just so different. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell me about yours a little bit. Is there like a, do you ever just say, okay, now is when I sit down and write a song. Do you, do you set that time aside or does it kind of, do they have to just sneak up behind you? How's this? They sneak up behind me. Um, I try to make a conscious effort. One of the things, uh, when I was learning from Kevin, um, Kevin writes a lot of autobiographical songs. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of, a lot of people do, you know, I have trouble not writing autobiographical songs. That's, I kind of made it a point as I want to kind of go the story route, Mm storytelling route. I want my, I want my songs that maybe tell a story. That's the screenwriter in you. I think so. Yeah. Uh, I just think my life's boring. I don't know. Why does anybody want to hear about my love life? It's I'm, I got, I've been married, you know? Yeah. Happy is boring. A long time. So, uh, yeah. So here's a song about snuggling. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't know here's a song about how I have no trouble. <laughs> What's the opposite of the blues? What's the opposite of the blues. Yeah. Oh man. And every song is in major key, of course. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's funny as I go back and look at, look at the songs I've written over the years, and I can definitely tell what band I was listening to yeah. at the time. Yeah, uh, was, uh, like, that song sounds like Oasis. That song sounds like Dave Matthews. That song sounds like. Uh, um, I think when I did uh, "Overdue" for Joint Subcommittee, Committee, mm-hmm. I think I was listening to a lot of King's X. You okay, know, you know that band? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, they're amazing, and not a lot of people know about them. Um, the funny thing is, some people, you know, you said, "Oh, that song sounds like." Yeah. To you. Yeah. You know, sometimes I've heard people talk about, oh, that's my song where I was just doing this. And you listen to it, you're like, oh, I didn't get that at all. I got the, just, you know, this was the thing you came up with. Right. But, and sometimes you listen and go, okay, I guess I see it. But, you know, nothing is created in a vacuum. Everything is built off of what came before it. Yeah, I mean, even the Beatles were trying to like write Elvis songs and even, you know what I mean? It's all like... Everything, everything gets built on the thing before it. And the way you can take all these different, you know, influences, it's just colors in the palette you have, right. but you're painting your own picture with them. You know, right. it's, I don't feel like anybody should get too self-conscious about their own songs in saying like, oh, the, well, that just sounds like this. I think so to a point, but I also think that like, you also... <laughs> Unless it sounds exactly like it. <laughs> I don't think I want to sound like Jimmy Buffett. You know what I mean? It's like more like I don't want to sound like somebody. Uh, I got you there. Um, you know, and knowing your music, you you have a very uh, kind of folksy kind of yeah. background kind of coming in. I'm not going to say country. It's not really country, but it's, no, I, uh, it's Americana, I would say. Yeah, yeah, kinda. yeah. Sometimes it drives on the same road. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you hear that. And then I played all those, you know, when I was. Bartending down at Folly Beach, uh, you know, I got a real introduction to that, man, not everything has to be under the boardwalk because it seemed like right. just every strummer in the world would come out there. <laughs> then all of a sudden, Graham Worley showed up. Oh, Graham's, yeah. Graham's a monster. Yeah. Um, he's played with this kid, Chris, Chris Wood, Woodrum, you know, mm-hmm. who since passed, he was a fantastic guitar player too. Jameson was out there. Uh, Kevin, Kevin West was out there. There was just, I was just like, I'm on Folly Beach and there's like just three... M- m- super guitar players yeah around here and it just kind of blew my mind how and, and everybody was different you know and, and it's just so cool um but as far as like the songwriting gets back to that uh just kind of pours out of me when it does yeah i'll just say it like that sure you know sure. i always feel like if i try to force it i i'm not gonna feel what comes out I'm going to mm-hmm. like make it like a factory or something. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It's, when you start, you know, obviously you're probably writing all these songs on guitar. I of would course. Say. Yeah. 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 Uh, do you demo stuff on your phone and, and all that? Or is it kind of in your head? Um, I've demoed stuff on the phone before. I've mm-hmm. definitely done that. Uh, most of the time I don't, yeah, I don't really, it's more to work. It's more to hear how I sound. Sure, sure. You know, yep. like maybe this is the, is this the right vocal, you know, like. Is this key, the right range for right me? Vocal yeah. key, I yeah. guess, is what yep. I'm looking for. Uh, yeah, because I, I don't know about you, but I think I sound completely different than I, I hate sound. the sound of my own voice. <laughs> like I, I, I edit these podcasts and, and it's a, it's a cringy time. But, yeah. 
You know, it's that is what it is. That's a whole nother podcast. Oh, when man. you when you start into a song, you've played in bands so long. Mm-hmm. Do you hear an arrangement? Do you hear like, oh, that's where the drums go. That's this is what the bass does. You mean for my own stuff? Like, yeah, yeah. When uh, you're writing songs, do you sort of like hear more than you're playing at any given point, or is it just kind of no? Because you know, I started off playing acoustic open chords. Uh-huh. You know, I didn't, I didn't take lessons. I took, I had a guy show me all the chords yep. and just mash my fingers into this super thick acoustic guitar. Yeah, yeah. You know that he had and. Um, uh, who was it? I think it was Chris said like yeah, people should start on an electric guitar. I don't know. I started on acoustic and it just seemed like everything was easy after that. It, I always say it's like swinging the bat with the donut on it. Yeah. You know, when you're in the, when you're in the warm up circle, once that donut comes, if you can learn on a terrible guitar, yeah. when you finally get a good one, it's good. <laughs> How nice is it when you finally like pick up a tailor for the first time oh and you play that like at the guitar shop and you're like, what? <laughs> Why does every guitar sound? They're like supposed this? to feel and sound like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, and it, the things you learn when you're playing a bad guitar, like if you can coax good out of a bad guitar, and then mm-hmm. you switch over to good one. Oh man, <laughs> it's instant. Who are your songwriting influences? Good question. Um, I guess Dave Matthews to a point. Like Dave mm-hmm. Matthews, John Mayer. John Mayer's awesome. I don't really. I just kind of like find songs or melodies I like and kind of mm-hmm. kind of work. I well, don't... I mean, if you had to even say like who are your favorite songwriters? Who? Oh, who okay. I, I see what you're saying. Um, man, um, I'm such a. I like. I think Daryl Hall and John Oates are like completely underrated. Oh uh, yeah, I think yeah. they're fantastic. I like. I'm still a child of the '90s. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think. Pearl Jam was great. I think Smashing Pumpkins writes a lot of good songs. Mm-hmm. I, I thought Siamese String was amazing. Anyways. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Tool. Okay. Tool's out of this world. Rage Against the Machine was just a one-of-a-kind band mm-hmm. that was insane to see, like, insane to, to just happen. Um, as far as, like, stuff that just, like, personally influenced my writing, I wouldn't say anybody in particular. I just kind of like songs. Like, yeah. I just kind of... Yeah. You know, and I, and I've, I, 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 you know, like, obviously I think every musician has periods of who they list. Everybody has a Zeppelin phase. You know oh, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Yeah. We all have. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody has a Zeppelin phase. Sure. I had a Pearl Jam phase, Dave Matthews. I had a 311 phase. Okay. Oh, big. T- I still have 311. I mean, big time into them. Uh, I moved out to Charleston. I got really big into jam bands. I got taken yeah, to the widespread, yeah, con- widespread panic concert. Mm-hmm. I mean. It's kind of my new favorite genre of music now. Okay, you know, I I can't I still can't figure out if these get twenty minute guitar slows. They're just coming up <laughs> off the cuff. I mean, right. what what are they doing? Are they playing on? Well, these see, they, they learned like scales and things. Yeah. like the stuff that we didn't we didn't have the attention span for. Yeah, they learned how to do all that stuff. And yeah, that's man, it's just, it's just. <laughs> but we went to that fish concert, dude, and it was like a thousand people just. Dancing the whole time. It, I've never seen a show where it's just that much. Many people are having that much fun. Are there, can you think of a couple? It can be one, it can be five. Can you think of just some songs that you're like, not even not even by yourself, where you just go, oh, that's a well-written song. You know what I'm saying? Do you want band or singer song or stuff? Anything. Anything where you actually hear a song and you go, oh man, if I could write a song like that, I'd really feel good about what I'm doing. I gotcha. Um, I think The Pot by Tool mm. is mind-blowing. Mm-hmm. Um, bounce around here a little bit. I think there's some Benfold stuff. Benfold's, Benfold's has a song called Selfish, Cold, and Composed. Yeah. That yeah. is one of the most beautiful piano songs I've ever heard in my life. Heck, I think Black Betty is amazing. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. From Ram Jam. I, you know, I, I there, it's funny as we do, I do have kind of a playlist of songs when I get a few beers in me. I'm uh-huh. like, yeah, let's put on some, uh, uh, let's put on this. Um, my wife and I recently refound um, uh, Easy Lover from Phil Collins oh, and, and Philip Bailey. That song's a bop. That song's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And there's an amazing guitar solo in that oh, song. Yeah. 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 Insane guitar solo. Oh yeah. Um stuff like that. You when know? you listen to music, are you 
I mean, it, it's different now that it's so convenient and you can have it mm. on your phone. It's not like when we used to have to go through effort to actually make a playlist. Yeah. But are you an album guy? Or are you a singles guy? I am from the age of right at the end of LPs. Yeah. I think my first thing I ever bought was Def Leppard Hysteria mm -hmm. on the LP. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course got scratched right away. <laughs> and then everything else I ever bought was on cassette. Cassette so, CD, yeah. Uh, I, I get the concept of album stuff. Um, I, I still think there's like, you know, I can listen to some, I don't want to hear a whole yes album. <laughs> I, sure. I'll listen to some of it, sure. but I don't want to hear all of not it. Not sober. Man. You know, yeah, <laughs> not all of it. I don't need a five minute, you know. Yeah. Blast off into space. From right. Blasting off into space. <laughs> Correct. But uh, I think John Mayer's, Fan, I think he's probably he was he was like the top of the game, and then like uh, like even Jam Band, he just quit all that and joined the Grateful Dead. He has the chops. I mean, yeah. he has the chops for it. Yeah, I think I think that, I think he he was like I love singer songwriter, but it's like wow, this, yeah, this is just it's such a scene, you know. And I'm not in a NASCAR, but everybody's like, just go to a race, and, you, and you'll see. <laughs> sure, you, if you're there, and, oh yeah, and you'll see what's going on. I mean, you'll fall in love with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's the spectacle of it. It's the communal aspect of it. The communal yeah. aspect is I got very you. big. For sure. Um, and it's so positive. You know, like there's a reason people take acid and go see fish and not Metallica. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's even reason, there's a reason people see, you know, don't take acid and go see Rage Against the Machine. Yeah, that probably. They might would. actually rage against the machine. Yeah, that probably wouldn't pan <laughs> out. Oh, man. You got another song you brought for us? I got one. It's, um, it's called Oh Girl. Uh, it's kind of a, kind of written for a duet. Okay. Uh, I'm going to sing it kind of both parts, but uh, if I can have my way on this song, I'd like to, I'd like to have a duet on this one. But, awesome. Uh, yeah. I like this one a lot too. All right, man. Let's hear it. All right. First time I see you, you are so fine, oh girl, I know, I need you in my Last time I know you are so fine. Oh, baby. 
Awesome, man. Appreciate it. You got to record that. You will. You got I I, I got to see the the Rodney Smith EP <laughs> or you, you owe it to yourself, man. I always I got I got some uh, some some uh, songs in the back pocket. I can maybe make one, you never know. Excellent. I'm looking forward to that, man. Got any other uh You've had some great stories, man, being in show business out there and uh anything else you got for us? Do you want to hear about uh uh Nirvana? Uh, yeah, yeah. I know you were in the in that documentary. In yeah. the documentary, it was yeah, that was like kind of my big thing. Um, yeah. So, growing up, I was always a Pearl Jam guy. Same. Like Pearl Jam was my my band. But if you, okay, if you, here's here's something that's not taken into consideration. Pearl Jam is a blues band. All their music is pretty much two guitars. It's based on blues band. Mike McCready playing big solos. Nirvana is a punk band. If you kind of break it down, big drums. Yeah. Really hardcore. Like so they're. They're not the same. Like I, I always, people are like Nirvana, Pearl Jam. Like they're not the same. No, one I, is based in punk and one is based in blues. In my opinion, I would say it's like Pearl Jam's like classic rock because Pearl Jam's very influenced by the Who. Oh and, yeah, and 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 Nirvana is more influenced by by punk by and punk and rock, yeah, yeah and yeah it's and, and Nirvana is it's like when people lump it all under grunge. Yeah, like there are some like Pearl Jam kind of is not a grunge band. I think Alice in Chains is a metal band. You know, like Alice in Chains. I could, is I could a metal put them in, in in a metal band. I would put Pearl Jam closer to like Guns N' Roses. Yeah. Than I would put them to Nirvana and Mud Honey and yeah. and true grunge and and post punk. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Nir Nirvana. Nirvana. So <laughs> this is the story, and this is this is a weird tie in too. So when we were doing the Eagles band, uh huh. Um, I get an audition. I show up. Our singer, David Daskal, is in the audition room. And I go, what, what are you doing here? He goes, I'm auditioning for uh, this. And I go, well, who for? He, and he ended up getting the part. He was Gibby Haynes from the Butthole Surfers in this movie. He had a <laughs> okay. scene that was cut yeah. out. But uh, we actually had a gig that night. And so he went in, you know, and he left after that. And mm -hmm. so I actually was going in for the paramedic, this guy named John Fisk, who yeah. was the guy who found the body mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. at the beginning. And so... I walked in and I handed uh, the director, this guy named Ben Sattler, the, uh, my headshot. And he mm -hmm. grabs it and he looks at it and he goes, you have an 843 area code. And I go, <laughs> yeah. He goes, I used to live on James Island. He goes, I used to drive around <laughs> in my car delivering pizzas, listening to In Utero. Oh, yeah. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. And so for about the next eight, 10 minutes, we start like talking Charleston. Mm -hmm. Finally, one of the producers goes. Uh, we need to read this guy. We got like a lobby full of people we need to read to. And yeah, so, yeah. You better just wrap so it up. So I read it. Got home that night. I got the part. That, like, that was, a, and nice. it, I could tell it was just kind of like, yeah, yeah. Hey, Charles the guy. And so, and then David got the part too. So yeah, it, it was, it was bananas. So I show up, I had one day of shooting mm -hmm. and it was kind of a late hire. Most of the time, if you get booked for a film, you have about one to three months before they film it. Right. I was shooting like the next week. Mm. But I only had one scene. I had one line. Mm -hmm. um, and I go in and I show up the first day. I had my own room, dressing room and everything. It was <laughs> awesome. And so uh, I look at the call sheet. I'm the last scene of the day. Mm -hmm. And I was like, shit. That means, yeah. that means yeah. like I'm going to be here all day long. Yeah. I was. Yep. Didn't do nothing all day long. So I wandered over the set. Tom Grant is on the set. He's the lead investigator mm -hmm. in the in the. Uh, and he's just kind of sitting around not doing anything either. So I, I chatted him up and I, was, I just started asking him questions, man. And uh, so my shot got pushed to the next day. So they were like, okay, you're going to come back the next day. The next day he showed up. It was again at the end of the freaking day. And so <laughs> I was around all day long again. So I'm, I'm hanging out. I got two days to sit and talk with Tom Grant about uh, what happened. Oh, that's awesome. Man. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. So if you want to know who did it, just let me know. <laughs> I mean, I, I have opinions, <laughs> but <laughs> I think we all, I think we all have, opinions. I think we all know who we're yeah. talking about here, but, um, yeah, he was just telling me all these stories about all these voicemails that mm. Courtney Love used to leave him. And... Does anybody like her? <laughs> I'm joking. Fun story. Oh my God. I show up, I show up to a band practice one day. Our singer Bree, uh -huh. real Bree. I was telling him about being on set. She goes. 
Uh, I went to a yoga retreat and Courtney Love was there and I talked to her and she was really nice. So I don't believe any of that. And I was like, well, you don't have to. I'll okay. Guess, but, sure. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah. I guess I if guess. you met her at a yoga retreat, she's cool. But, I guess that's, yeah. I guess that proves it. <laughs> that proves that uh, she's yeah. not a murderer. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, that was, um, that was really cool. That was like something oh. I, I never in a million years thought I'd get to do. And I actually got to talk to John Fisk on the phone, who was the guy. In the film, they had me break in a window with a flashlight. Mm -hmm. uh, but in real life, he, uh, he just kind of like moved it. Yeah. But he was telling me that they used to go to that address all the time mm. and it, for overdoses. And it was Courtney. It wasn't, it wasn't Kurt. Yeah. Courtney was overdosed all right. the time there. So they knew right. the address. Yeah. And then they said they got in there and they found the body and like nobody knew. There was finally like one young guy on the crew. Mm. It was like, holy crap, that's Kurt Cobain. And yeah. uh, he he's very unassuming. I mean, he's kind of he was kind of a small guy, and yeah, yeah. yeah. But just man, I, have I, you I, seen Soaked in Bleach? Yes, I actually I recently read uh, Mark Lanigan's book. Yeah, him Mark Lanigan kind of alluded to in his book that he stopped by. Probably as Kurt was dead and like knocked on the door, didn't get a response and went home. Well, it was in a glass house. Yeah, it was, it was on out top of a garage. It was, yeah. Like, but he was like knocking on like the front door. Oh yeah. Because him and him and Mark Lanigan and Kurt were good friends and Kurt kind of given him a few messages like, Hey, I'd really need to see you. I really need to see you. And they'd both had, you know, substance abuse issues and everything. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, I finally just decided I wanted to go over there and see him, and, but he wasn't home. And then the next day is when I heard. And, yeah, yeah. That's, it's, so what happened was is they, uh, they called a uh, repairman out. Mm -hmm. and he went around and he was looking for, I guess, outlets or something. And yeah. he, he just looked saw, in, saw a body on the floor called the cops. The yeah. uh, first responders came out, John Fist. They were actually firemen unit. Mm-hmm. Uh, got in there and they said like the blood was dried, like it'd been there a while. Mm. And he goes, all this stuff about how the, the head was blown off. He goes, that's not true. It was right. just like the back part. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I got to, uh, talk to him for a couple of days. That was, that's very that cool. Was cool. Man. That's um, awesome. yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming out today, Rodney. Um, I, you, like I said, man, you were the one of the first people I met when I came to town. One yeah. of the first places you really encouraged me to get up there and gave me some good advice. Like, Hey man, I know you like your slow, sad songs, but just, just, I know you can pick it up a little bit. You don't have to do it all the time, but people, and, and, and I took it and it's good advice. So, but man, I wish you luck in, in all you do. I can't wait to hear your, your solo record. That's oh. definitely coming out and man. Thank you so much for stopping by. Thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, that was my conversation with Rodney Smith. Thank you, Rodney, for all the support you've given me when I moved out here to Charleston and for coming on the podcast. And thank you, the listener, for listening to Songs of the Unsung. You can find more information about the podcast at songsoftheunsung.com. Also, the Facebook page, Instagram account, or YouTube channel. If you're a singer-songwriter, I'd love to talk to you. Feel free to reach out to me, and we'll set something up. Sorry it's been so long between episodes. I'm still trying to get everything together. Um, I'll do my best. Thanks again.